I'm Alexander Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. I'm delighted to welcome our guest today, Paolo Gerbaudo. He is the author of the new book, The Great Recoil, Politics After Populism and Pandemic. He's also senior lecturer in digital culture and society in the Department of Digital Humanities and director of the Center for Digital Culture at King's College London. Thank you so much for joining me today, Paolo. Thanks for having me, Alex. Uh, Paolo, one of the things I, I wanted to ask you about just from the outset, um, when we think of the great recoil, and, the, and we're not there yet, but this post-pandemic universe, um, what strikes me from a US perspective, uh, given how wealth was so centralized we never think of, of the past. And, you know, it was, it was illuminating to me to, to think of during Senator Warren's campaign you know, that she had policies that really addressed the, um, as you call it, the great recoil, mm -hmm. but it was the pre-pandemic recoil. It was the um, economic realities over these last decades. And I just wonder how you, how you think of not just the present and the future, but the past when it comes to policies in countries where the policies favored um, a smaller and smaller percentage of the people having access to capital. It's very good to start from the past and see how for the last four decades, there was basically a consensus, a bipartisan consensus across the center left and center right on so-called neoliberal policies or free market policies uh, that had a very specific content. I mean, one we have become familiar with to the point of considering it in a way the only politics that existed, namely liberalizing uh, different sectors of the economy, namely cutting social care, uh, austerity in key public services, health, education, uh, privatization of different sectors of the economy, uh, a cult of the entrepreneur, a cult of free enterprise, uh, and this idea of the self-regulating market. And this is something that's been going on for uh, 40 years now, right? and has dominated politics and has led uh, to globalization as we know it. And indeed, it has resulted in a huge enrichment of, of the uh, global rich class, which has now really reached grotesque proportions. I mean, as you were mentioning during the pandemic, uh, the billionaires added several trillions to their wealth. And now there are, I mean, big global corporations that are hiding uh, very big uh, um, piles of money in uh, tax havens. Right? And it's really this imbalance, fundamental imbalance in the economy that's been described by authors such as Thomas Piketty, uh, Stiglitz, and many others, uh, that is now, in a way, um, th that is at the root of our problems. Not, not just the problem of inequality, but also the problem of a stagnating economy. Because we've been through a decade before COVID, through a decade of stagnation, stagnating demand, uh, because people don't have money. I mean, ordinary people, the people who uh, consume, don't have money to make very basic purchases for, uh, that are essential for their everyday life. And this is bad for the economy as a whole. How do you consider how policies can be adopted now that take into consideration what you just said as sort of the, the status quo of these years? Because, for example, for those who accumulated all those wealth, you know, all that wealth in tax havens over um, the period of, of a decade or decades, not just in the U.S., but we, we've, we've read the Panama Papers, we've read all the sort of contemporary investigative reporting that this is not an American phenomenon, it's an international phenomenon of a plutocratic class abusing its, um, its privilege of, of what should be serving the people and, and, and instead serving only itself or um, the elites. And so the question is, how do you ever address all of the economic unfairnesses of the past, right? I mean, it, it's like, uh, in effect, I feel like reparations is the right language to be considering. 
I think first and foremost, we need to realize that uh, this plutocratic class, uh, class, as you rightly put it, will not be very happy about uh, uh, the treasury, about the state trying to claim back some of the money. Uh, they will be, and they are already very worried about redistributive policies. I mean, I just saw before an uh, advertisement on the Financial Times, prepare for times of higher taxation uh, and people considering moving money to Switzerland or to whatever tax haven. And what happened during the heydays of globalization was that companies, multinational companies that were really the protagonists of globalization uh, found ever new tricks to evade the control of the state. I mean, and tax savings were the most spectacular example of that. But they often did that precisely with the complicity of the state and precisely with the complicity of the political class. I mean, think about the tax savings of the UK and the US. I mean, they could be very easily closed down if there was enough political will to do that. Uh, there was this narrative about the impotence of politics and uh, the, the powerlessness of politics, the inability of government to act against these corporate behemoths. Uh, but to a large extent, it is a, a false narrative. I mean, it was a narrative that was manufactured precisely to say we cannot do anything, right? I mean, globalization is unstoppable. These corporations are unstoppable. The only thing we can do is manage it. So perhaps whatever, try to steer it a certain way, but we cannot guide it in any kind of substantive sense. And therefore, I think that now politicians are... In changing their minds, change their moods, in a sense that uh, all this idea of low taxation has been essential to international competitiveness, is progressively being abandoned. Let's think about corporate tax being raised in the UK. Let's think about the effort of uh, Joe Biden regarding a kind of global corporate tax regime. Small steps, but they are interesting because they are an inversion of the tendency we were used to, right? We were used to politicians reducing ever more uh, corporate tax. Well, now we see some uh, signs of inversion. And it is really that recoil moment, right? Is the moment when the wave hits against uh, uh, the rock and then it kind of uh, comes back. That is what we are really seeing at the moment, especially since the COVID pandemic has made right. this problem ever more apparent. I think what you said is true, um, that there is a climate in the, in the air now that, that is receptive to, at least in the political class, these changes. Um, in the case of the UK, if you if you don't want your public health system to, to default in effect or you know to just uh, collapse, you, you need to raise taxes to invest in in the in the health system. In the US, uh, that might be analogous to to, to infrastructure um, and the and the failures of, of American infrastructure over many decades. Um, you know, and, and, and it's scary how many decades it's been. Um, the, the, the concern that I have is, is that, you know, when, when you think of that neoliberal streak, that it, it, these changes are still going to operate in um, this kind of model that is cannibal capitalism. You know, I, I remember mm -hmm. um, a USA Today correspondent wrote a book, Cannibal Capitalism. And I've used that phrase in, in homage to, to him ever since, because I think that, you know, to, to incrementally raise rates in a climate of, of cannibal capitalism, I really cannibal capitalism havens, um, it, it feels as though, um, you know, you're, you're using, um, you know, a, a fly swatter for, um, you know, a, a, a problem of, of such great dimensions of, of you know, infestation when you think of um, the, the trillions that, you know, all of these socially irresponsible companies in particular have, have made over the course of the pandemic, specifically Facebook, um, but also, you know, Google and and uh, Twitter are not, are not uh, innocent bystanders by any means. But you know, when, when you think of what you identified, I, I just don't think ch changing tax rates is going to unleash the recoil in the way that you mm -hmm. envision. So I'm wondering what, you know, what are the advancements beyond tax rates that are going to 
enable policymakers to, to kind of get a hold of, of, uh, of all of this capital that's been um, proliferating around, you know, just a, such a small fraction of, of, of people. I, I just, it's almost like an, an inaccessible mm. problem. I mean, I want to believe in the great recoil in, in, in the sense that you just defined it. I mean, my general argument is that we are moving from neoliberalism to neostatism, which is fundamentally uh -huh. a change in capitalism. We're moving from a model of free market capitalism to a model of state capitalism where state intervention, which anyway is always there in, in any market economy, becomes ever more apparent and central. That applies to many things. I mean, obviously taxation will be a, a very important hotspot of conflict, right, between uh, 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 ordinary citizens who want better public services, who want social care, who want social spending, and the rich who don't want to give away their money. But there are many other important areas. Let's think about trade. I mean, one big pillar of neoliberalism that has fallen in recent years is the idea that global trade is always good. Right? I mean, it was already obviously Donald Trump with his uh, trade war with China and the EU that uh, already knocked down uh, the credibility of the pillar. And actually, Biden is continuing on the trials in the sense that he's doing that in a more, in a softer way, uh, in a more indirect way, but his uh, uh, public procurement uh, is uh, by American public procurement rules are a form of protectionism. They are about incentivizing more the local economy. They are about creating a way more economic autonomy. And also, if you look these days at the keywords, at the catchwords used by uh, management schools, uh, by capitalists, uh, is in a way an inversion of what you had in the 90s and 2000s. You remember all this discourse about offshoring, about relocation, about externalization, about outsourcing. Now the new uh, trendy words are the likes of insourcing, reshoring, farm shoring, shorter supply chains. Uh, why is that? Because globalization is crumbling as a result of many facts, uh, partly also change geopolitical situation. And therefore, we are moving towards more national and regional, in a sense of world regions, economies, um, where big powers, big economic powers, will try to identify a sort of primary market, being the domestic market and the regional market, which they want to focus on uh, more, more carefully, uh, because of the huge risks and unpredictability that is involved in steady globalization. We saw that with a um, supply chain crisis, with a Suez uh, uh, canal crisis, right, with a, uh, recently. Uh, we saw how easy it is to disrupt global supply chains. So now, in a way, capitalism is becoming more aware of these risks and uh, uh, calculating them, making them part of the equation. Well, it's fascinating to hear you say that globalization is crumbling. I mean, in your words, mm -hmm. that. I, I find that to be a really interesting insight because all of the memes of, of globalization are still there. You know, the way in which we're connecting today via Zoom, or if I were to hop on a plane and see you in person in the UK where you're, where you're based right now. Um, what do you mean um, by, by the fact that globalization is crumbling. I, I understand you're saying it in, in the sense of economics have turned inward and countries are focusing on domestic, um, domestic politics and, and domestic economic um, outcomes, even as if you were to say that in the US, that's so much more of a trope than a reality. I mean, mm -hmm. I think that we've been talking about insourcing versus outsourcing for many years. I mean, since Ross Perot ran for president, it was, mm -hmm. it was long before Donald Trump in, in the sense of seeing globalization as a threat, as problematic. But when you, when you see globalization crumbling, um, what does that mean in, in the short term and then the long term? Globalization is usually defined as economic interconnectedness at the planetary level. I mean, it can be measured through a, a number of factors. I mean, global trade, foreign direct investment, Already during the 2010s, people were talking about slow globalization or a progressive deglobalization because obviously there was a significant drop after the 2008 crisis in global trade. Then it picked up slowly 
but in ways stagnated, and actually foreign direct investment uh, um, decreased over the 2010s. And we saw during the pandemic, there was a sudden drop in, in global trade, then slowly recuperating, but never at, at initial level. And the same thing for, for foreign uh, direct investment. We are seeing that in geopolitics, right? I mean, it is increasingly apparent that the US and China are carving their own spheres of influence that are military, that are diplomatic, that are economic. Um, there is a process of balkanization of globalization, we could call it. Actually, even within the Western sphere, we saw recently with the submarines pact, right, between uh, the US, uh, UK, and Australia how also NATO countries uh, that are considered to be allies are increasingly uh, facing uh, disagreements and are, they may in a way split into partly separate blocs, like right? one uh, again comprising the UK, the US and perhaps Australia, and the other one, uh, the EU with uh, uh, France and Germany kind of being more interested, not, not taking for granted anymore that the EU will be militarily protected by, by the US. I mean, something that in a way became apparent already uh, during the Trump years. And then take Afghanistan. I mean, the, the, what, what happened there is a huge recoil moment because the invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan was the high point of military globalization, right? Was the moment where, uh, in a way, the US and the UK felt authorized to really act as uh, the kind of policeman of the world intervening even without UN mandate. And, and the fact that now, uh, they are instead compelled to, to retreat. It's a sign of uh, uh, um, growing isolationism, which is what Trump ran on, and also what the problem is uh, Biden ran on, um, because the public doesn't want anymore, the public doesn't believe anymore in exporting uh, democracy, but also in exporting many other things. I mean, all the cult of exports for exports' sake is uh, progressively being criticized and partly abandoned. What do you see as the healthy form of global connectivity, if not, we're gonna use the, the term globalization. Um, but when you think of a state where um, global economic um, well-being can be correlated with domestic you know, well-being um, for each, independent autonomous country state if we're driving towards a, a, a place where globalization means something different you know in tangible economic terms what what the output of that is and it's the focus is inward how are we measuring you know sort of the the well-being of of, of the planet together uh, mm -hmm. because climate for instance you know is something that has to be enacted ultimately as as a collective uh if one country makes inroads with uh greenhouse gas emissions and capping them or carbon tax that's not going to make the difference so um i i'm just struggling to understand and, and want to understand from you what could be and maybe you're saying it's not possible but what could be a healthy um relationship between independent countries economies and the international economy that allows us for example to preserve some international order and norms because mm -hmm. if we're only looking inward i i'm concerned um that um safety public safety climate health um are going to ultimately decline and not not be you know, something that's preserved. It's about cycles, right? I mean, um, this is what Karl Polanyi, a famous Hungarian economist that I use a lot in the book, uh, said, is that after moments of capitalist expansion, you tend to have these moments of involution where, uh, in a way, you are bound to have this inward-looking moment, which is not necessarily bad. Obviously, it has many bad aspects. It can go into chauvinism. It can go into... Uh, that kind of isolationism, but it's also about a, an internal reorganization, the reconstruction of, of centers of organization of, of social units starting from the nation state. Now, obviously, we all prize many positive aspects of globalization, uh, freedom of travel, uh, freedom of uh, 
expression, the circulation of ideas, of opinions, uh, uh, global culture, uh, pop stars, uh, the internet, you, you name it. But we also need to go back to some old wisdom that was uttered at different points in time by the likes of Aristotle in ancient Greece and then by John Minor Keynes right in the 20th century, which is about autonomy. Autonomy as the basis of freedom and economic autonomy. In a sense, obviously, a state will always be engaged in commerce with other states, with other countries, because uh, you cannot, uh, you know, uh, grow uh, avocados in uh, in Iceland, or uh, perhaps you can do it with geothermal. Let's say there are different areas of the world that are better suited to produce certain things, and it's not just agricultural products; it's about any kind of, of product, really. So there will always be uh, global trade, and global trade that is mutually beneficial, right? People who are good at producing something, and people who can purchase it at a lower price and a higher quality. The problem comes when countries become overly dependent right. on global commerce. I mean, think about countries in Latin America, the extractivism, like in uh, the uh, exploitation of primary resources, minerals, uh, oil, it does reduce these countries into what is described as, as the Dutch uh, disease, namely a situation in which you become over-reliant on, on, on exports of these primary goods, which carries all a series of problems. One major problem is that that often leads to underdevelopment of any other sector, right? because it becomes so easy to export uh, uh, minerals, to export oil, to export soybeans, that it's not convenient to have your own manufacturing, for example, uh, or your own uh, technological sector. Um, countries turn into monocultures. And that is really bad for uh, the economy because people who don't work in that sector are forced to migrate uh, because you're very prone to cyclical shocks. For example, say you're already dependent on tourism. Tourism is a very cyclical sector of the economy. When there is an economic crisis, you're going to suffer much more than it would be the case if you had a more diversified economy. So we need to accept that obviously there are global problems, but uh, politics is not global, it's only party global. Politics really starts from place and starts from the nation, it starts from culture and identity. And these are things that for all our idealism, we cannot eliminate. Uh, they are part of our history, they're part of our being human beings really. Uh, it's, it's about language. It's about the fact that we speak different languages. We have different cultures, different histories. And then that doesn't preclude international fraternity, international solidarity. I mean, international solidarity needs to start from an acknowledgement of diversity of uh, the human family and from the acknowledgement that each human group has its own right to a certain degree of autonomy in its decisions. At the end of the day, Paolo, when you think of how you can still preserve global security uh, and climate health, like the, the two issues that I point to, we obviously will continue to have bodies like the UN and NATO, as long as there are, um, you know, there, there is multilateral diplomacy. That's not contingent upon um, international trade. But, but I think there's a difference between the international trade that has been feeding into those cannibal capitalists and an international trade that actually is locally sourced. And I'll give you an example during the pandemic in, in, in you know, still ongoing with our experience in the United States, you have historically, um, you know, conglomerates that have distributed um, food when everybody was really looking how can I eat safely um, and, you know, dining facilities were considered a, a transmission hub um, at one point and still to some extent. So um, the service Gold Belly um, opened in the United States to enable local to have meaningful impact nationally. So you have local, locally distributed um, vegetables and meals, um, and it's not just the behemoths, as you say. And so I'm wondering, um, as an analogy to that internationally, is it that, glo is it that, that globalization's crumbling, or, or is it at least that 
that the, the, the kind of monolithic behemoths of globalization are crumbling, but giving mm. birth to the possibility of kind of local stakeholders being able to dictate their terms so that the jobs are preserved in, at the municipal level. But can we have that kind of economic governance where you know, local jobs are preserved, but there's still an international system governing them? I think we need to avoid uh, sort of utopian and insular idea that we are just going to bring everything back to place. But at the same time, there is a certain trend towards relocalization. And uh, to a large extent, as a consequence also of climate change, because transporting goods uh, has a huge carbon footprint. Uh, merchant ships produce a lot of pollution. It is in a way absurd that we produce uh, very heavy goods uh, in one place and we transport them to the other place only because in place A, labor is much cheaper than in place B. There are some irrationalities of the global economy that have to do with uh, uh, sheer kind of profit imperative without taking into account the environmental costs that are externalized to everyone that need uh, to be abandoned. Also some developments in new materials such as graphene that can be produced without uh, rare earths or very rare minerals may also aid this development. And also renewable energy. I mean, uh, with oil, uh, it tends to be concentrated in certain parts of the planet and therefore it needs to be transported. And it, it actually accounts for a very significant share of the of global trade. With renew renewables, by definition, you're producing them locally. So it could help in this uh, partial relocalization. Then again, uh, commerce is always going to happen and international trade. But the important thing is that we focus on the forms of trade that are really mutually beneficial and that they are first and foremost sustainable uh, for uh, each country and, and for the planet. Paolo, uh, we're running out of time. I want to thank you for your insights today. Uh, Paolo Gerbato, uh, author of The Great Recoil, thank you so much for being on The Open Mind. Thanks, Alex. Please visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash openmind to view this program online or to access over 1,500 other interviews. And do check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Open Mind TV for updates on future programming. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, Lawrence B. Benenson, the Engelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.